Rolling solo tonight, everyone. Uh, I'm just happy you can see me. Uh, we had we had that that typical last minute fun of making sure. I think I I need a new lightning port on the phone or something. So uh, if you could let us know if you can hear us, 
that'd be great if everything looks all right. Um, excited about tonight. It's it's a great way to end this live tying season because trout is about to begin. I'm excited. Um, we've got you know 25, 30 people tuned in, which is great, and I'm sure that that will grow. Uh, again, if you can hear us, let us know, and then uh, I'll jump right into it. Uh, apologies for the film tour promo. I forgot that that was on there. <laughs> it's been a busy week. Um, hopefully I got to see everyone there. That was a great event. We had some good local films, even uh, the Asabo film, which you just saw the promo for, was really cool. Um, and it's it's worth seeing if you still have an opportunity somewhere in the country to go see that. Uh, you should na- make note, though, in your calendar about the Cheese Cup coming up. That's June 8th this year. That's our biggest event of the year. Uh, if you if you make it to one thing, I'd say make it to that. So we're getting thumbs up across the board. People can actually hear me, which is good, and see you, and see us. So I'm excited tonight uh, to introduce our guest is Todd White, uh, who drove down today from the Sioux to come see me, um, and tie some brook trout flies, and which is really cool. And we got to talk for a while about how you got into this, and you know you know, your progression through helping at fly shops and just getting into tying. And you started at what age again? What was that? Uh, fly tying? Oh, yeah. 11 yeah. or 12. In okay. My, in my parents' basement. That's awesome. Up, that's up, a, in the, up in the UP. <laughs> yeah. That's a good, that's a good place to start. I, yeah, yeah. I was, I stumbled into, I don't even know how into a, a fly tying class that was like at, it was like a free period in middle school. And I had to have been 10 or so. And I still have some of those flies, un- yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This- my folks, somewhere in, the, somewhere in the garage, my folks have one of those old green and tan flip top tackle boxes. Yeah. That I put just like white. Like packing, the hammered packing. metal or the. No, no, the plastic. Yeah. The, the, the plastic. <laughs> the, you know, the plastic you could drive a truck over. Yeah. But you know, I, I put the, uh, took white foam. And put it in all of the slots, and then uh, that's got all my original flies and stuff in it. Stuff, and uh, but I learned off of a, a pirated Jack Dennis videos. <laughs> so so while everybody else was learning to tie woolly buggers and stuff, I was learning to tie humpies oh and my royal gosh. wolves and stuff. But I didn't have I didn't have a lot of good materials at the time. So I don't know if you've ever seen a humpy tied out of orange super hair. Yeah, and like yeah, you know, and like. A, a monochord sure <laughs> oh yeah it, i'm sure it looked like a bunch of my humpies to yeah. get started yeah. because that fly used to drive me bonkers and yeah. uh, you know there's tricks you learn along the way but the right materials you mentioned i mean it makes all the difference in the world yeah, and that's and that's i think a so consistent good. theme for a lot of our guests is to invest just incrementally more in the right materials mm-hmm. and they'll do a mm-hmm. lot of the work for you, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, it makes it, it makes it, it makes a ton of difference. You know, a lot less struggles. Yeah. It's, Oh my gosh, the humpy. <laughs> 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 I remember I have, I still have it. This little blue fly tying manual. I mean, it was like 20 pages mm-hmm. and it's one of those, you're afraid the pages are just going to disintegrate in your hands. That's what I had for my grandpa. It was like, smelled musty like <laughs> like like a thrift store and they were all pencil drawings you know there's yep. no there's no pictures yep. they're just pencil drawings yeah. of what you think it's supposed to look like which was always fun so mm-hmm. it's yeah it's mm-hmm. um but you've been you know a little bit around you've been in lower michigan not just the up i think mm-hmm. people associate you with the up you might have your YouTube and Instagram handle to, to blame for that. I would yeah, say, you know, for fly life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But, I've been back in the UP for, uh, this is my 14th year after, after, after leaving and going to school downstate. Okay. And, uh, working at a fly shop down there, uh, part-time for a while and, uh, getting back into fishing after kind of taking my whole undergrad off and then just really getting back into it. That's probably safe to take it off, though. I I didn't mm-hmm. fish much during my my undergrad at all, mm-hmm. really. And mm-hmm. I look back and think, wow, 
had I have fished, I probably would have gotten terrible grades. <laughs> like <laughs> five years would have turned into seven or something yeah, like yeah. that, you know? So yeah. it's, but it's, it's fun to come back to. Yep. And that's, I think yep. I, I see so many people at the shop. I'm sure anybody that's worked at a shop sees that excitement of people coming back to it. I had two or three guys today, just, mm -hmm. I haven't fished in forever. I want to rediscover that being a kid feeling, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's the fun of it. And I think that's what you do a lot of is go and explore and find, you know, tough to get to spots. Yeah. That's really what I'm into. So it's like any, like, like we were talking about earlier, if I, if I have a day off and I decide I want to go fishing or, or I'm, I'm working and I'm thinking about fishing or most of the time, you know, like sometimes I'll get the boat out, you know, sure. I get the boat out every once in a while, but most of the time I'm, you know, bushwhacking down a two track, trying to get in farther than other people and sure. see if I can find a, you know, maybe like a master angler. Yeah. Brook trout out of, uh, out it's of, a, a, fun... out of a little creek sometime. Yeah. So, that's, I, I like that thing. little fun, you know, explorations and hunts for yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So, and I love, I love big brook trout. There's something about brook trout when they get, when they get to like a foot long Yep. and they come out of a hole and they crank whatever you're, whatever you've thrown in there and you come tight to them. And then those big fins come out and stuff. Yeah. And every time I see that, I mean, they, they look like a great white shark yep. that like Derek de Young. Sure has like has, has like captured has been, has been yeah. after has been after with his watercolor yeah or, yep. or his oils or something like that yeah. they're just so they're just so cool well yeah. and usually you're finding them in such cold pristine water mm -hmm. maybe i'm biased i think they're the prettiest of the, you know it, but yeah. they seem to have a little mm -hmm. more life to them when you hook into them sometimes i mean i think we've all caught a few disappointing fish mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like, wow i thought that was going to fight a little bit harder but brook trout rarely disappoint no no in my no, mind no, no. So, alligator rolling in a yeah. lot or just you know coming out straight out of the water for the dry fly yeah, yeah, yeah. i love it yeah just turning on their heads and you know all kinds of stuff i'm crazy about them so for all for all you for all you uh, uh watchers out there uh brook trout are the best trout and uh, if you have a differing opinion, you can uh, let Matt know about that in the comments. <laughs> oh, geez. We're going to cut that up. Uh, I think that you can go head to head with Ross about, yeah. with his bluegill. <laughs> you bluegill, know, yeah. His bluegill thing. We're going to have, you know, we'll do maybe shortcuts from everyone's, you know, yeah. thing. It'll Put be, them all together. Yeah. They need to get, you know, get Ross be like, you tie get one of my big bluegill and yeah. tie him to the tail of your brook trout. He's going <laughs> to, he's going to pull him all over the lake. I could see Russ saying that. I want to <laughs> ask you quick before we get started yeah. about a little bit about your fly box. Um, have you simplified over the years, expanded? I know you've gone back to kind of find, I know you've, you've brought some special guest flies, mm -hmm. you know, if you will, some mm -hmm. callbacks to things we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Do you like fishing older style patterns or do you just find that they're simpler and they work or do you, you know, borrow from them for new stuff? What's your, what's um, your style? Would you say? I would, I would describe my style of tying as like new old. Okay. So I love the old classics. Like I brought some, I brought some stuff, some examples to show today of, um, of flies that have been around for a long time and, uh, and, uh, and are, and are very, and, and are very, are, are very, uh, very efficient and good for and fi good fish catchers and stuff like that. Yeah. But what, um, but, uh, but what, but the thing with me is my, my thing is like, I walk into a fly shop and I go and I, I go down the wall and then there usually there's going to be something on that wall that pops for me. Yep. And either I know exactly what I'm going to use it for, or I know I have to have it because <laughs> That's I, right. I, I, I know I have to have it. And like, you know, like the cone we're going to use on this first fly is one of those things that I had this, I had this idea in my head after doing some reading and uh, some reading after reading some old, uh, some, some older, uh, uh, um, uh, trout fiction you could call sure. it and stuff like that. And had been thinking about it for a while, but it didn't click for me until I saw this cone head on the wall at a shop. Yep. And then I knew what I was going to do with it. And it turned out to be, just really, really good. I like that yeah. progression a lot. I, I was mm -hmm. talking with a guy earlier. Mm -hmm. You were in here. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, 
you're just looking for one piece of a puzzle. Yep. You don't know what the puzzle yep. is yet. Yep. So I, I don't know how to describe that. It's But for me, it's walking around in a hardware store. I know what the problem is. I don't know how to fix it. I, it'll jump out at me mm-hmm. if I just have all the pieces in front mm-hmm. of me. And that's, that's what I love about fly shops mm-hmm. is you have everything you could want for the most part. And I'm the same. I have a drawer full of, or two of stuff at home. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to use it for, but I had to have it. Yeah. And I'm not going to apologize yeah, for yeah, it. So yeah. it's cool. That's fishy. I'm going to use it for something. Exactly. Eventually. <laughs> yeah. So where do you want to start tonight? Um, well, I'm going to, uh, well, we'll start uh, in my hometown. So I'm from uh, Ishpeme, which is a uh, Gazantite. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little town uh, just down uh, 41 west of uh, Marquette. Okay. A little ways off of the, off of the highway there. And uh, we have a couple of famous residents from Ishpeming. Um, actually, we have a whole bunch now because I have to give a shout out to the uh, the Lady Hematites 2024 girls basketball team. Oh. A couple of weekends ago, just won the, the Division Four state basketball championship. Oh, wow. Well, that's cool. So well done, Lady Hematites. Nice. Other than the girl 2024 uh, uh, Ishpeming uh, High School uh, girls basketball team, um, and as far as fishing goes, one of our more famous residents was John Volker, who uh, wrote um, a number of novels and some sp- some fishing specific uh, uh, fiction and uh, writing and stuff under the under the uh, the pseudonym uh, Robert Traver. Yes. So his most famous novel was Anatomy of the Mur- Anatomy of a Murder. Yep. Which was based on very uh, famous. Yeah, a case that he tried as a Marquette uh, County prosecuting attorney, which he was for a number of years. He also held a, the position of a Supreme Court justice for the state of Michigan for a while, for a few years. Um, after um, his fishing books are uh, Trout Madness, Trout Magic, and Anatomy of a Fisherman, yeah. which of the three I have two. I haven't found a, a copy of Anatomy of a Fisherman yet. I, I have, I have neither. Uh mm-hmm. I reluctantly gave a copy back of, of Trout Madness to somebody <laughs> that yeah. loaned it to me. I'm like, man, I, I'd read this again and again. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's worth checking out if you've not spent much time diving into Michigan trout literature. It's a it's probably the best place to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really fantastic. And it's and it's UP specific, which is really which is really pretty cool. So um um Let's see where where was I? Um, oh, Ishpeming, oh, yeah, tight. Ishpeming. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, uh, John Volker. So in Trout Madness and, and uh, in Trout Magic, and he has a uh, John Volker's. Uh, he has a whole fishing. He kept fishing journals and he yeah. called them fishing notes. And it was like fifty years worth of journals where it was everywhere that he fished and how many fish he caught. And he did like the Hemingway thing where he disguised a lot, all the places names Yep. and uh, him and who was with him and, and, uh, and, and, and how the fishing was and all that kind of stuff. And at numerous spots in fishing notes and in trout madness and trout magic, he refers to this fly that he got from Paul Young and Paul Young was um, a very famous bamboo rod maker and fly tire from the Detroit area. And uh, he even has a Trout Unlimited chapter named after him down yep. there. So um, Paul Young was tying uh, flies for Mr. Volker. And uh, in, numerous, in, num- in numerous places in his stories, in his fishing notes, he, you know, he, he references this fly, Paul, this Paul Young killer fly. Okay. Number 10 killer, uh, red, with a, red and gold with a white bucktail wing. So I tied one up. I searched and searched and searched, and finally I found in an article on the American Museum for Fly Fishing, There's a they have an article on the fishing notes of John Volker there, and there are some photographs associated with that with that were, were actual flies donated from his collection, and they had one. They had a Paul Young killer, and this is all it was. It's red. <laughs> it's a number 10. Number 10, nymph or a wet fly hook, red floss, gold rib, gold tinsel rib, white bucktail, and a red thread head. And that's all it was. And I was like, wow. 
And uh, the reason that that, that particular, <laughs> they, fl- you know, they say, don't meet your heroes. <laughs> yeah. You know, never meet your heroes. But the reason that that fly stood out for me in the reading was that every time he referenced it, it was associated with a big fish, his longest brook trout, like 17 inches. Yeah. His, what is his, his large, his largest or larger brown trouts, you know, 18 inches or above. All, all caught on the, all caught on this pattern and stuff. And then once I saw what it was, I was like, wow, that's really simple. Um, I can't believe he caught them big fish on that, you know? And then I got to, th- I got to thinking about it. I was like, you know what? That's a, that, that's a, that's a Michigan version of a trout fin, which sure. if you're familiar with, the northeastern um northeastern fisheries for brook trout in maine vermont and new hampshire stuff like that um there was some wet there's a whole series of wet flies called fontanalis and trout fins and there's like a dozen different variations of them but they all have the same kind of color palette to them and they and what they were done what they were and the reason they were tied the way they were let me just throw them in here because it'll be easier to explain they were tied to look like a brook trout fin. So what some of these old northeastern fishermen were doing was they would catch a trout. And uh, their trick was to, they catch, a, they catch like a male brook trout. They cut the pectoral fins or the anal fin off of it, the large fins. They throw it on a hook and they throw it over and they catch fish on it. So this, these whole lines of wet flies with these, a lot of them had married wings this is a married goose or a duck quill wings would be red and with black and white edges, just like the regular, just like the natural fin on a brook trout. Hmm. So, so, so there's a whole, and I was like, that's what the killer is. And uh, John Volker called it the candy striper. Okay. And he referenced yep. it as a candy striper because it was, because it was striped like that. So I got to thinking, man, I should, I should really, uh, I should really tie something up a little because uh the last couple of years what i've really been after has been large larger brook trout i was like oh, i've never seen anything like that in a fly shop i've never seen anything like that um you know not very 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 little of that online or anything like that i've never seen anybody fishing any of that anything like that in the up i mean it's you know closest i could come would be like the red and white daredevil right you know you're throwing for pike or something so the fly that I came up with actually came about after I found these at a fly shop. And these are from Wopsy. And they're these really awesome red painted cults. And uh, so I had picked up some of those and then uh, was messing around. And the fly that actually came out of it was this. Which is, you know, it's nothing special, nothing really special except for the color pat, the, the, the color palette on it. So you've got your red cone. So this is my version of my conehead muddler version of Paul Young's killer or John Volker's candy striper, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, it's, it, so it's a youper version of a trout fin fly. And, uh, so I tied up three of these. I threw them in my box. I figured I'd, I'd try them, you know, the, the next time I went out, I, uh, I fished them. I caught a couple of smaller fish right away. And then I got to a little better looking hole, you know, the one you think you might, there might be a decent fish in there. Kind of got a suspicion and, uh, just tanked the cast. I mean, tried to, tried to flip what, tried to flip what, tried to flip it right in the hole, came up way short and that fly hit the water and I started to pick it up to bring it back and like a 11 inch brook trout came out of that hole seven feet and cranked that thing and that was the rest of the day so whether i cast it good or not fish were just on it so it's been uh it's been a really 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 good fly for me the That's last three awesome. the last three years or so it's just uh it's uh and especially in that dark water we've got up there i can see it really good the fish can see it really good and uh you know, there's some, there's a little bit of debate about what the whole trout fin thing is, whether it's territorial or it's 
cannibalistic. I think it's probably a bit of both. Sure. And, uh, and, but, uh, but this particular fly, this is a size 10. I tie it in tens and eights. I'll run an eight. If I'm, if I'm looking for, uh, if I'm really going for like bigger fish, stuff like that, but it's been a really great, so really, really great fly for me. Well, and, I, thought, uh, I like the contrast to that too. And I, I find that there's a fly I love that has a very prominent white wing mm-hmm. and anytime you can see a fly in the water, you're, mm-hmm. I truly believe you will fish it better. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely. more engaged. You yep. understand what it's doing. It's, it's like, you know, you're playing a video game or something, you know, mm-hmm. you're kind of controlling, Oh, let me add a little mend here. And, Oh, I see that hole. I can get it to just dance in there. And it, it's such a fun, I think that bright white wing. And does it drive you nuts? I I'm always curious. We, we always are trying to come up with the silver bullet, right? Mm-hmm. And we still end up with kind of these classic concepts that people have figured out forever. Ago. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, red and white. Who? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But you don't see that color combo in a fly shop. No. It's, and mm-hmm. I tell people that all the time. You know, maybe pay attention if you want to do something different. Pay attention to the color combos that aren't in here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Play with that. Yeah. Don't be afraid of that. Lean into it. Yeah. So let me throw this guy back in here just for a second. The one yeah. I got done. So this is basically just a conehead marabou muddler tied in uh, trout, fin, uh, trout fin style. So we got a red cone. If uh, you can't, uh, you, you should be, um, any of your local fly shops, like Northern Angler, should be able to uh, order you these red cones from Wapsie. Oh, yeah. It's a Wapsie product. You probably won't see many shops with that sitting on the shelf, but no, if you're no, lucky, maybe. No, <laughs> no, no, but it's a Wapsie product, so any shop that carries Wapsie should be able, which is most of them, yes. should should be able to order yep. it for you. So, uh, what size cone do you put with that? T- um, ten this there? Is, this is a small. Okay. I, already, I use a, I use I use a small for the eights and the tens. Yeah, same size. Yep. Oh, well, that makes it easy. So we've got a small one. So we've got a small red cone. If you can't get the red, just sub a gold. You know, you can't get red tungsten. So when I want a heavy one, I just go with a gold tungsten. Yeah. So then we're going to have some red deer hair. I happen to be real fond of nature spirit products. So we've got some spinning hair there. We've got a white marabou wing. Is that just a bugger marabou there? Oh, uh, yeah. I actually prefer the bugger marabou. I see those I'll talk, I'll talk. squared off tips. That yeah, looks nice. Yeah. No, that, that's what I prefer for it. Well, on but, the small scale, it makes sense. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then uh, the body is uh, the ultra. Uh, what's it called? The ultra chenille. ultra chenille in the micro, I believe it is smallest size. Either yep. the either the fine or the or the micro. I'm going to say the micro, little guy. The rib is a medium gold tinsel. You know, this happens to be a laser gold that I picked up somewhere, but you know, any old any medium gold tinsel will work. And then you've got a red marabou tail, again using the tips of the bugger marabou right so we'll go ahead and get started with this guy so i've got a size 10 hook in the vise with my red cone on it the hooks that i like for these flies one that i've got here is the arex ns 118 the classic streamer hook which is my favorite, but uh, if you need to sub, the Daiichi 2220 is uh, pretty much the exact same thing. It just isn't black. All right, so I'm going to use a little lead-free wire here. And I'm going to put about, I'm going to put 12 to 15 wraps a lead-free wire in here. Snap that guy out of there. I'm gonna push that guy right up in the cone. You can see when I do that, it does angle the cone a little bit. It doesn't really bother me. Um, uh, doesn't really doesn't really bother me. If it bothers you, you can go with a uh, with a straight eye hook. It doesn't matter. Attach my thread and make a little dam back behind this, so my 
lead doesn't spread apart. The thread I'm using, and the thread I'm going to use probably all night is going to be a GSP 50 denier in white. The first two flies, the first two flies, I'm using it for its strength and its uh, choosing G the, the thin diameter GSP for its strength. This one, because I'm going to be spinning a little deer hair or stacking a little deer hair. And the uh, second one, because we're going to be cranking down on a wing. I love those uh, really thin gel spuns oh, yeah, nowadays. They're, they're so handy. It's it's changed how I tie. Yeah, I it's was really so surprised easy. that Russ was using it one last time. But. I know. I <laughs> yeah. All right, so I've got some woolly bugger marabou here in red, in a nice red. What I did was I sorted through there till I found one that had nice square tips. So that's kind of what I prefer. You can use the ones with the round tips too. It doesn't matter. You can use blood marabou. Um, the reason that I use the, the woolly bugger marabou is that uh, it's uh, it's got more body to it. It gives you a bit more of a give you gives you a bit more of a tail for the number of, especially when you're putting when you're when you're doing small flies like this. It beefs it up a little bit. So I'm going to come in measure this guy. Not quite the length of the shank. I don't need a super long tail here. Move him right there. Grab him with our thread. And wrap him back to about the barb of the hook. Move that guy up. So I'm filling a little bit of that space behind the lead with this tail. Get rid of that. Then I want to secure my lead. So I'm going to do so. I'm going to wrap some without a lot of tension. And then once I get up to the front here, I'm going to pull a little, little bit on it every couple of wraps and pop that thread down in between those lead wraps and hit that hook shank. And we'll bind that down real good. Make sure you don't pull too hard on it because that GSP will cut that lead. It will. See how I did there? All right, good. So we got our tail on. Next piece we need is going to be our rib. Got my gold tinsel. This is double-sided gold, which I think is probably the reason why I use it. Normally, your, uh, your normal spooled tinsel is going to be silver on one side, gold on the other. If that's the case, then you want to tie it on facing you with the silver, with the silver also, also facing you. In this case, I'm going to tie it in just like that. Throw that in my materials holder. We're ready for our body material, which is our micro ultra chenille. I'm going to take my scissors. I'm just going to very gently strip some of that chenille off that core, like so. And then bind this down. Move our thread up to about a hook eye width behind the cone. We're not going to need a lot of space. You want to make sure to uh, don't crowd don't crowd yourself, but we're not going to need a whole ton of space for tying off the other stuff. How are we doing? Doing great. Doing good? Okay. So then I'm just going to wrap this guy. If you're a rotary person, you can use your rotary. I, uh, I use my rotary. I have a rotary vise. I have this nice green one purchased at the Northern Angler. Nice green Ranzetti. I, uh, I tend not to use my rotary for a, 
whole lot of stuff. There are certain things that I do use it for, uh, but not for like wrapping. I tend to like wrapping stuff by hand. I think part of it is how you learned. Yeah. Yeah. That. And then, um, sometimes I can't get, uh, sometimes I can't get the, I can't get like the wraps packed in tight enough, yep. get a firm enough body using the rotary. I can't, can't pull on it hard enough and get it to, so sometimes, uh, no. So that, that can be, that can be an issue sometimes, but if it's not an issue, I'll use the rotary. So now I'm going to counter wrap this gold tinsel. Did you say what size that tinsel was? I'm sorry. Um, it's a medium. It's a medium. Yep, okay. medium size. Yep. So I'm going to get like probably f like a good four wraps on a size ten like this, and you'll probably get a fifth one on the eight. Make sure we tie that guy down real nice and get him out of there. All right. Now we're ready for our wing. Again, I've got another already pre-selected out another white woolly bugger marabou. And again, this is a this is a good way to use. I find that this is a good way to use some of the best feathers for this for tails and wings on these little uh, on these smaller size like uh, marabou muddlers and stuff like that some of the best some of the best feathers in these packs are the the little short ones around the edges of the packs and stuff the ones that you wouldn't normally use for other stuff so it's a really good way to to, to use a material you wouldn't normally use and i didn't explain it when i did the tail but here's a little trick that i learned from watching andreas anderson um uh, really excellent swedish tire is um uh, if you watch his videos on the A-Rex hooks or the uh, fly dressing, I think is the yep. other website that he does a lot of stuff, I think the YouTube does. channel that he does stuff on. If you watch him like tie, like uh, he ties like a gallop sex dudgeon and, uh, and, and, and stuff like that. It makes watch it look he, easy. Yeah. Yeah. It makes <laughs> it look really easy, but I just know just, uh, just, you know, watch it a couple times, pay attention to what he does. He's such a technician. I love watching him tie. But I notice that when he do, when he puts marabou on a hook, he doesn't just smooth it down and put and he grabs a hold of it and then he gives it a twist and that turns it into a into like a poof and I really really like that profile for my wings on this fly or anything else giving it that twist really uh, really amps it up. I have no idea if it makes it fish better. <laughs> if it gives you confidence, yep, yep. it confidence will fish is, better. Yeah, confidence is the, is the key. So I'm going to lay that guy right right on top behind that cone. Put a half a dozen nice tight turns on him. We'll make, make sure that I got him right on top. Looks pretty good to me. couple of extras this can be kind of a i might pink my wing here a little bit because i've already handled the red stuff be a little red on my wing that's not a big deal i'm going to come in with my scissors and trim that out as close as i can get it and then because i've got this Real strong thin th thin thread. I can just wrap all that underneath. So there's where we are so far. Almost there. I'll put the deer hair head on it. All right. So I've already prep. I've already pre-prepped one clump of hair just for the sake of speed, because we had a little time getting ready. So I'm going to, I'll do the other one now. So I'm going to trim, I'm going to, I'm going to clip off 
a fairly good sized clump of hair. I want to make sure that I have enough hair. I'm going to do a, I'm going to tie a clump in on top and on bottom, and I want to make sure I have enough hair to come down around the sides and, uh, and, and fill in all the space. So I've got a pretty good sized clump of hair there. Of course, some, we're going to lose some of it. So I'm brushing out all that under fur and various garbage. Out of that. I want my tips to be nice and aligned, so I'm going to throw this in a stack. I like to do the bottom side first. So for those of you who cannot see, Todd has two stackers lined up. So that's pretty nice. So you, do you do one hemisphere basically in each so you're ready to go? Or Yep. yep. That's, yep. And I think it's, yep. it's, you know, especially having, you know, a very intensive deer hair discussion last round, it's, I think it's good for people to see that spinning is not always the answer to solve, especially yeah. if you're looking to do precision. I mean, on the sizes you're tying, it's, it's vital. If you try and spin this, it's going to be, I'm sure it'll work, mm -hmm. but it'll be, if you want the precision, it's yeah. really nice to do it in yeah. two halves yeah. like this. It'll work fine if you're good at it. Yes. I've never been terrific at spinning deer hair, but, uh, so there, so, but, but I can get the results that I want stacking. Yeah. So look, kind of like kind of like Alan last time. Yep. He's like, there's a lot of there's a lot of folks who just stack everything because spinning takes practice. And uh, you know, and uh I wish I was better at it. <laughs> so what this, I'm gonna do is this I'm, seems to work fine. <laughs> yeah, it works good. It works it works good. You'll see in just a second. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure the tips of this just short of the hook point, which doesn't leave me a whole lot of hair. To hang on to and I go around with my GSP once give that a little clock counterclockwise spin just because my thread separated on me a little bit no no tension on it and I'm gonna start to draw down on it and once I get a little tension on it what I like to do is I'll come and I'll put my Put my finger on the cone, press down with my thumb, and then finish tightening it. My vice just slipped a little bit, but I saw that. Yeah. We'll get that fixed in a second. Tighten him up a little. There we go. Now, if I, you see, we've got something real similar to what Alan had last time. Yeah. When he did his first stack of hair. So we've got hair all spread all around the hook and a nice clear spot for that next stack to go in. So we'll stack our second one. Being a little guy, I'm not going to bother with like super gluing or anything like that. Well, I think the cone kind of adds a little bit of protection yeah, in, really, in a way. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know really what to call that, but I've noticed that any anytime you can tuck things and your final wraps into a cone, it there's a... Uh, not such a fine margin of error. Yeah, it becomes a it becomes a lot more. Uh, I'm more likely you're gonna throw it in a piece of wood and lose it than it, than it's gonna blow up. Right. Make sure we get this guy stacked good. Get rid of some of those broken tips. All right. Make sure we get my wing out of the way. Just going to come in, just kind of eyeball the length of that hair, set them right there in between, set them right there on top, make sure I got a good grip on them. Again, spin my thread a little bit, one wrap, no tension, two wraps, no tension, start to pull down, grab the cone. And as I'm tightening, I'm going to flatten him. Get 
probably helps to have uh, not the super light wire hooks at this point. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because this is that, about as light a wire as you want to go. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So then, just for security's sake, I'm going to tease one more wrap. It's not 100% necessary, but I just, I always do it. So, and then just that guy in there and that'll take out any spin. You see that you probably saw that the deer hair spun a little bit mm -hmm. when I tightened it. That's what I, that's what I want. I want those, I want that stuff to be, I want it to be in place now that I've kind of set it where I wanted. And just to make sure that everything's spread, I'm going to cut this in the round. Oh, I want to have a, a, a round collar and a round uh, shoulder on it. I'm going to press down on it from the top, give it a squeeze, the whole time maintaining tension. Make sure I get that hair all nice and. So essentially, you're you're trying to take out any play. Yep. Is that is that how you would describe what's happening here? Is, mm -hmm. and I I love calling attention to what tires are doing with their offhand. Mm -hmm. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's the easiest, maybe overlooked thing as, yep. as, as for new hand. tires yep. is, you know, what's happening with that offhand, whether it's stabilizing scissors or, you know, taking the, the play out of the deer hair, it, it's, it's how you get that, the next level, you know, skill set. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a uh, learn to tie who, who had to have been Jack Dennis. Yeah. Jack Dennis, learn to tie with your free hand on the vice. So, yep. Yep. So, all we got to do to finish this guy is I'm going to pull this hair back. And you'll know that you got the hair in there good when you, if you pull it back and there's really very little space between that hair and that cone. Because then I'm going to maintain tension on the thread. I'm going to bring that through the hair, get a couple of wraps around behind that cone. And this is probably securing and helping wedge that hair up. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then just come in with a, with a whip finish. Four or five turn whip finish. And then, like you said before, that's all going to be hidden underneath behind that cone. You don't have to worry about trout teeth getting in there, chopping it up. It's going to be very, very durable. Now we've got a trim. And you notice that, um, at least, uh, like watching on YouTube and seeing other people tie and stuff like that, people do different, different stuff. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with, uh, really the way anybody, anybody does any, anybody does anything in fly tying, you know, but, um, you notice that I left the butt ends of the hair. I didn't pre-trim them at all. I left them, I left them extra long and I did sure. that for a reason, for a really good reason, which I'll show you in a second. So I got a razor blade. I'm going to trim this guy. Now, um, Alan, last time, does all his trimming with a whole razor blade. I'll show you guys a trick. Mm -hmm. Get a pair of hemostats. I learned this from a free fly tying uh, demonstration way back when at the old Nomad Anglers in Okemos. Or it might even have been Miles Chance Orvis before it was even Nomad Anglers. There was a gentleman that they had in every year for their fly tying demos. His name was uh, his name was Jim Reed. Okay. And he's from Howell, Michigan. He was a fire chief there. And he was the first gentleman that I'd ever seen. You know, this was back, you know, back really before the, the internet and all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, maybe back when it was just getting started, but uh, he was the first guy that I'd ever seen who ever did like crazy cork stacked deer hair bugs i mean he did bats and everything where the whole <laughs> bat was cut deer hair what? out and lacquered <laughs> and all that kind of stuff so we would cut we come in, everybody would come and we would sit and we would just be in awe of this guy because he'd stack all this hair on it and he used the old bic pen oh my gosh for a, yep. for a yeah for a uh, thing and stuff and he'd come in and he'd stack all this hair on this hook and then he'd cut it and then he'd spend 45 minutes just telling stories while he's trimming this thing until it literally was like a piece of cork. Man. And, and uh, so, and uh, that's the one thing 
that I, uh, the one thing that I took away, uh, the, the, probably the, the first thing that I ever took away from Jim Reed's tying was, it's okay to cut your razor blades in half. Yes. <laughs> and you just do that by, you, you just, like I just did, you just grab them where they're connected on either end with a pair of hemostats and twist. Yeah. They popped right in half. And that way you, you don't have to worry about catching that razor blade in the finger because that would be that's that's one thing that i'm always worried about is maiming myself like that with a razor with a razor blade because they're so sharp and having that thing there and i like you know like i catch myself all the time with this like switching around and putting my finger on it and (laughs) so there's so safety first everybody (laughs) let's see no that ain't even gonna work don't worry about it don't ever all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start and I'm just going to use the cone really as a guide. And I'm going to, this is one of those times when I'm going to use my rotary. I'm going to take this, my half a razor blade and I'm going to bend it. I'm going to lay it right on the cone and I'm just going to saw back and forth a little bit. See how far that got me. And then I'll rotate the vise and saw a little bit more. Just saw and push a little bit. Let the razor blade do the cutting. You don't have to push it. It's really sharp. Just kind of move it back and forth, kind of like a saw blade a little bit. Until I get close to that, to my collar, which is the tip, which is the the tips of the hair. And I can start seeing that collar through that hair like that a little bit. And I start getting a little bit more careful. And here's the reason why I left the hair long. Because instead of continuing to push back into it and maybe bumping into my collar and then having something uneven that I have to fix and go a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and stuff. The easiest thing to do is with this long hair, Take the razor blade and put it right where you stopped and then bring the hair to the razor blade. That's a great tip. That's definitely something I've, I've struggled with. I know a lot of people where if you're, you know, using the whole chunk of hair, you know, for the collar and for, you know, the head or whatever you're, you know, putting together, finding that separation line is yeah. so tough. It's so easy to go too far. And then you have to go too far all the way around to fix it. Yep. And pretty soon you got something that you're just not. There's nothing left. <laughs> so you can just kind of just keep rotating the vise and going around, grab those long butt ends, pull them forward into, or if some of them kind of get trapped back, in the collar and stuff you can go ahead and usually just pull them right out all right so a little sloppy right now so i'm just going to go back bend my razor again i'm just going to use that cone as a guide and just round that off And you can take as, um, uh, like with many things in fly tying, you can take as much or as little time as you want, making this as, make, making this as neat as you want. I would say, I would hope that if you're going to tie it, you're going to tie it as a fishing fly and just not worry about it too much. And that, I would say, is pretty close. Now, there's only one thing that I've... As far as like fishing this, fishing this pattern and conehead marabou uh, flies in general, when you kind of tie them in the round like that, because the cone is such an easy guide to help with doing that. But what I find is what when you do that, sometimes you get sometimes they tend to uh, they tend to rotate. They don't keel very good. 
like uh, like Alan was talking about with his bass bugs last time and stuff, because they have the same amount of deer on the top, on the top and the bottom. So what I like to do just for uh, fishing sake is I come in from the bottom, coming on the bottom and I kind of flatten it a little bit. And the other thing I like to do is I push just a little bit further back into that collar and take a little bit of that hair off. Oh, that hook is sharp. And once I'm done with that, that guy's ready to go catch big brook trout. Awesome. We've got some some folks in the audience pretty excited about talking brook trout and small stream exploration and oh, getting cool. away. And well, I think people can identify with that because even catching a you know an eight inch brook trout, you know, on a light rod is it's exciting. It's, yeah. it's quiet. You know, yeah. you're listening to the woods. You're not always paying attention. Sometimes you're zoned out yeah. when you're, yeah. you're fishing. Yeah. Sometimes you jump a bear sleeping off the, <laughs> sleeping on the edge of the, <laughs> happened once. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've scared many deer, um, among a few other things, yeah. but not yeah. luckily I, I guess maybe I'm too loud to scare. Yeah. I was bear. sneaking, I was sneaking up on a bend. Really nice deep bend. I'd spotted it from downstream, so I got out. I crawled, snuck up on there. It was all like tall grass and ferns and stuff, and I snuck right up to the edge. I poked my rod out there, and I took the fly off, and I needed to get some line off, and I'm running a little, I'm running a little, little click and paw reel, yep. click and paw reel, and I'm sitting there, and I went. And <laughs> the opposite bank was about a foot higher than I was, and it was all tall grass. Sure. And this big black shape jumps straight up out of the grass <laughs> and hits the it hits the ground and luckily tears off in the opposite direction oh jerked him right out of whatever it sure. with, with, well. click, with click and fall never since that day i've uh most of the time when i'm fishing most of the time when i'm fishing i've got a podcast running in my pocket in my phone sure so human voices <laughs> that's awesome I mean, I've, I've gone to the, well, when I used to live out West, I'd, I'd put a little bell or something, you know, yeah, especially yeah. if I had the dog with me. Oh, yeah. that was always the dinner bell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It felt that way. Sometimes you just look around, you don't know who's watching or, or paying attention. Um, we had someone ask if this might work in, uh, in Western waters or British Columbia. And absolutely. Ooh, I think, yeah. yeah, I think. This type of fly has, yeah. you know, universal appeal. It's, it's simple. It's like you said, I mean, the muddler's been around forever. Yeah. This is just a bolder Mud contrast yeah. with, with a lot of callbacks to some classic color yeah. schemes. And, yeah. And this is, this is, this is just a, this is a, it's a, it's a muddler minnow that's like heavy. That's like, like, like heavy keying on, or it's like, it's like, it's like, it's tight in colors that, hopefully we'll trigger we'll trigger we'll trigger you know like and eat from a char right i mean which well which all the char so so if you were on the elk river and you were hunting and you were hunting bull trout you might want to try it would uh, i would try a big version of this sure yeah. oh yeah go yeah. big i mean that's yeah. it yeah. like like i said earlier you know pay attention to the, i it sounds nerdy but i'll go and look at color schemes from what gear guys are using. Oh yeah. Yep. Like I'll look at if I'm tying flies for smallmouth, I'll go look at mm -hmm. okay, what what color are they making tube jigs out of? Mm -hmm. What color are, you know, guys running big baits for um pike with? And I'll integrate that into my color schemes and a lot of times it's different from what you see in a bin. Yeah. A yeah. lot of times it's I don't yeah. know, it's odd, I don't know, but it's it's a cool setup. So yeah, yeah. Because I was really into because I was really into gear fishing and stuff like and stuff like that before I got into like and before I got into heavy and trout fishing and stuff. Um, I I do the same thing. I equate a lot of that stuff. I mean, like I don't tie a popping bug or 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 a diving bug or anything like that without pearl crystal flash off the back of it yeah. because i have so much confidence in the rebel pop r 
with that feathers and the crystal yeah. flash on the back of it. Yep. <laughs> you know, I just, I just, I don't go without it. <laughs> well, it, it's funny to me. I, I get a lot of folks that will come and ask me about, you know, what color should I tie for pike? And I, I love throwing flies for pike. And I'll tell them if you're going to have one, have red and white, the classic daredevil color. And unfortunately, folks are sometimes disappointed that I don't have a top secret, <laughs> you know? Oh yeah purple and blue you know or some something weird to tell them yeah, and yeah. like well yeah. oh we have yeah. that and i'm like well yeah. then you know you got yeah. the right thing that's yeah red easy. and white red and white red and white daredevil <laughs> red works. and yellow yep five of diamonds daredevil yeah. yep that's what else all you, you need, need? <laughs> 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 nothing <laughs> all right so uh um i didn't have one tied up but i just wanted to show you guys um uh a way that you could uh if you wanted to you could uh you, you could you could juice this guy up a little bit if you wanted some more flash or something like that. And again, it's cool materials, right? Dirty water fly. Makes oh, yeah. an anodized red cone, small cone. Really cool. And then instead of the chenille body, you could use something like the mini flat braid. Oh, yeah. Build up yep. a mini flat braid body with the stuff if you wanted to amp up. You know, you want to put you want to put a couple strands of a uh, 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 opal uh, of uh, of uh, the the mini stuff. The I love the opal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the mini opal. Uh, like uh, the lateral scale or the something. Lateral scale. Yep. yep. Put that in the wing. You know, there's is it's no wrongs, just right. Yeah. You know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that is my version of Paul Young's killer slash. Volker's candy striper. Well, we've got some, we've got some people that are excited to tie that up and try it. Uh, yes, so please I'm, do. I'm, I will include myself in that. Or if people just want to send me stuff, that's fine too. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why you're you're tidying and and tinkering there? Do you want to talk about how you usually fish that? Yeah, yeah. So. I fish a lot of small water and uh, probably, you know, like it's, it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to say, it's hard for me to compare because I don't fish in the local area yeah. much and stuff at sea, but um, at least uh, um, I would say smaller, smaller than, uh, smaller than average, okay. I, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, and it's hard to, you know, I'm no good at like measuring how, uh, don't how worry. far away it is. Yeah is or something like that so i like um so a fly like that i'm gonna fish on a small rod now, because the places that i fish are small they're tight um i always you know like when people ask actually that's a really good way to put it when people ask me questions like that um i say usually i say something snarky like well i fished all day yesterday and didn't throw a bat and didn't throw bat cast yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, so, <laughs> I use a lot of times I, I relate river size to how many lanes of road. Yeah. Because ev hopefully yeah. everyone knows <laughs> what they're, yeah. it doesn't feel that way, but yeah. Yeah. A lot of places that, a lot of places that, that I seek out and stuff are like half a lane. Yeah. Or less. Oh, it's fun. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> You're not always waiting in those situations. No, either. no. And that's yeah. one thing that we should talk about for fishing and stuff yeah. is that I have, uh, um, if I was going to give somebody advice, let me grab the rod. Here yeah. Quick. Yeah. I have like a, I guess I have like a couple of caveat or a couple of like hard, fast rules that I use when I'm fishing small water and stuff. The first one is if at all possible, stay out of the water scout. So, so I, you're a lot quieter out of the water than in the water. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, if, um, a lot of the places that I like to fish and even some of the larger places and the better known places and stuff, if you're in the water and you hit gravel that you didn't see or, 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 or a roll a stone mm -hmm. or trip on a trip on a log or something like that, you have just let everything you've let every fish that you can see as far as you can see downstream and as far as you can see upstream in most of these places, you've let every fish know that something big's in the water. Yeah. You, you've let them know that something's not right. And, uh, and I've actually like seen it happen. I've had fish that were rising 
upstream of me and was taking my time and just made a bonehead move and made some noise. I heard it. They immediately went, you know, stop it, rising. Yeah. And, oh, bummer. You, you, I mean, like see them coming up and then be like, as soon as it, as soon as it, as soon as the noise hits them right under the, right under a dead oh, you know? And then it's like, yeah, you know, I could probably tease them out of there with a the streamer. Right. But you know, maybe 50, 50 shot, you know, but, um, anyway, um, because I'm fishing normally pretty small water, I like, uh, I like smaller than normal rods and I really, really like it's so bright here. I can't tell if there's, I really, really like glass. You're good. It's actually pretty good. Yeah. Really, really like glass. So this is my favorite rod. This is a seven foot three weight. Um, this is a Swift Epic, which is a New Zealand company. Fast glass two. This particular one is built by a gentleman in Pennsylvania. His name is Matt Lederman. He has a company, Lederman Fly Rods and stuff. He does beautiful, beautiful work. Um, so I have a couple of... Uh, that thing is awesome. Yeah, custom just wiggling build. it, you can. Yeah, it's really nice. It throws. A, um, it's a three weight. Uh, typically, I don't fish anything lighter than a three or a four, even in the shorter rods. Mostly because I like to, I like to fish things that have a little bit more weight on them, like the like that conehead muddler and stuff. Yeah. And if you go too light, the rod's just not going to be able to turn stuff over. If you do get a chance to roll cast or something. Here's another example of one I brought. This is built by a Michigan guy, uh, Shane Gray from Britain, Michigan. He has a uh, gray wolf uh, fly rods. You can find him uh, on his website. This is one of his actually his own line of uh, rods called the Nomad line. This is a 511 two weight. It might have the most backbone of any two weight glass or otherwise that i've felt which is kind of cool yeah yeah and that, that's why that's why I, I like that i like that rod i actually haven't fished this one yet it's a i, I bought it for myself for uh for christmas but i was pretty excited when i got it and put it together and wiggled it i was like yeah that's gonna throw everything i want to throw yeah which is rare in a two weight well so. i think you make a good point to you know if a lot of these flies i i love throwing little wet flies too mm -hmm. for for these fish and if you're throwing any sort of weight, if there's weight beyond the tip of the fly line, mm -hmm. you're going to struggle if you go too light with a rod or a line. And there's there's some great lines out there now that allow us to do a lot more. There's some great creek lines and, mm -hmm. you know, there's some fun stuff. We're in the heyday of awesome fly line technology yeah. for sure. Yeah. So yeah. it's you got to keep that in mind. You can't just go light for light's sake. You need to balance it a little bit. Yep. 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 You need to have, a. um, uh, I personally, um, uh, I have, uh, I have one of, uh, essays, uh, lines I'm going to be trying out, um, which is, a, a wait for it. I personally run nothing but double tapers. Okay. Just for like roll casting mm -hmm. and, yeah. and uh, that kind of stuff, either SA or Orbis or whatever I can get my hands on. Sure. Really? So, well, there's not that many options anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, there's exactly. you don't see uh, you know, six different double taper options. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh I do have one of SA's new um I forget what it's called. Either their uh, one of their creek creek lines or something it's like that. I'm looking forward creek to trying trout. that. Out. Yeah. Yeah, creek trout, I think it is. I'm yep. in a three weight. It's cool. Yeah. I, I have yeah. one. It's it's a fun line. I'm looking forward to it. And then like you were saying, as far as leaders go, because I'm uh, because you're using the short leaders in order to turn stuff over, especially something which has a little bit of weight to it, a weighted streamer and the stuff. Um, I want a, uh, I want a short, uh, I want a short leader and a fairly you know, stout leader. Um, so it always used to be, um, Orvis used to always be the only company that was making a six foot leader yeah. and then they discontinued it and yep. they discontinued it. But luckily SA came through with us. Oh, there you go. Yep. So this is their absolute creek trout, which they offer oh, I a six about that. footer. I should. I'm supposed yep. to know that. I think. So. Yeah. So I order. <laughs> so, I, so I order. I, I, I like every winter. I order a half a dozen of these guys. Yeah. And just three X. That's all I run is three X. And then I do. Then what I do is, um, so I have a, 
whether I'm running a six footer or a seven footer or a seven and a half, if I'm fishing a little bigger water or something like that, I, uh, I have a leader that is shorter than my, as long as, or shorter than my rod, which is important for things like bow and arrow casting and stuff, which you're going to do, a, which I do a lot of. And if you're going to fish small, small water, you're going to do a lot of it too. Right. So, so what I do is brand new leader, take it out, uh, take it out before the trip, get it stretched out. Um, and I'll cut the tippet section of it off, attach a tippet ring, and then, you know, like either reattach that original tippet or just run off to run off tippet spools. And that way I can run 18 inches, 12, 12 to 18 inches of fluoro, 3X mm-hmm. fluoro. If I'm going to, if I'm running streamers yep. or if I run into a fish that's rising and I want to throw dries, I can I can Quick throw 18, 18 inches, 18 inches of mono on there. If I need to go down to four X, I can do that uh, stuff. And then the other thing that I'm doing with leaders is just started doing this a couple of years ago. And these actually work really good. I've been furling my own leaders. Oh. So this is, uh, this is like, I think, I think the one that I like best is eight pound, eight pound Maxima green. Mm-hmm. Yep. So this is not a, let me unwrap it here. This is actually not a, a traditional furrow leaders for a leader in order to do like real furrow leaders. You have to like make like a jig with like pegs on it and stuff and go back and forth. And I'm like, I watch those videos and I'm like, no, I'm not into that. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, you know, I got to go fish. Even with this winter? <laughs> yeah, yeah, even with this winter. I don't have time to be making wood jigs and stuff like <laughs> and stuff like that to do that. I'm not I'm not handy like that. So, here's what it looks like. So it's got a thicker butt. About half of it's thick, doubled over. It's actually doubled over. And then the front half of it is like two strands. Go to a tippet ring, and then whatever tippet you're running. And what I usually do is I uh, I tie these up so that the leader itself is uh, five feet. Is five feet. Now the best way to learn how to do this. This is not uh, not a traditional um, uh, furled leader. Like I said, the furled leader is a lot of is a, takes a lot of takes a lot of work and learning how to do it and stuff. This is what I, I would call this a twisted leader and a really easy, there's a really good demonstration of how to make these on YouTube on uh, there's a page called in the riffle. So if you just go, if you just uh, go to YouTube and search for uh, for leaders, that'll come up. He, he does it with a couple of different kinds of uh, materials. Like you can do it with any mono or uh, you could probably do it with fluorocarbon. I don't do that. I just, I switch tip it for the different stuff. He's These, got a ton of stuff. I yeah. I mean, years ago I learned to tie a lot of stuff from his yeah. his page. I yeah. don't know if he's still associated with the shop or not. I don't yeah. I don't know, but I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but if when I pull on this, a little bit down, a little bit down, a little bit down. Perfect. And then when I pull on that, you see the give it's got? Yeah. It kind of un, it kind of winds and unwinds. So it's really really good at protecting protecting tip it. And it's re- it's really it's re- it's really supple, hmm. but it's also uh, but it's also thick at the same time. So it turns over the heavier stuff really really nice. So if you're uh, if you're interested in uh, in uh, in doing that, check out that in the riffle video and learn how to do it. It's not that complicated. It takes a little bit of practice learning how to keep the different. Uh, different pieces of, uh, different pieces of, uh, of mono from following up sure. with each other and stuff. But it didn't take me long to learn how to do it either. And then you can do like, you know, make a half a dozen of them and, you know, you're not going to go through that. Right. In a, in a season. You'll be, I mean, like I'm still, I'm, I'm still, I'm still rocking these guys. You know, we did have a question. If, yep. You know, if you're, do you ever play with short poly leaders at all? Or, or the short sinking leaders at all, um, which I'm a big fan of. If you have the yep. room for it, 
but you're fishing in a little bit tighter stuff a lot of the yeah time. yeah i i have tried them but in the in the bigger water in, in the in the bigger water where i can where i can run more of a normal kind of a kind, kind of a kind of a leader setup sure yeah i think it's one of the best if you're if you're a little bit curious about fishing a streamer for the first time it's one of the friendliest things you can do to achieve depth mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. still maintain good casting because mm-hmm. they're just so easy to cast and they do the work for you getting a fly down. Yep. You know, instead yep. of adding weight to your fly, which works as well, but is usually less satisfying to cast. Yep. And that, that, uh, tungsten powder will load up your rod even easier. Yeah. So you can yep. shoot some stuff out and it works pretty well, even roll casting. Yep. 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 No, I do like, a, I do like them and use them. Um, this next fly actually would be a good fly. Uh, it would be a good fly to use in a setup like that. It's more like a, it's more like an unweighted kind of a wet fly kind of a thing. So, so if you guys are ready, okay. All right. So here is a tied up just for demonstration purposes, the classic Mickey fin. So classic attractor streamer, old timey, old timey, uh, uh, attractor streamer. Got a uh, red bucktail sandwich between a uh, yellow bucktail and a little silver flash with a rib, you know. And uh, I guess I don't really know when that fly was developed, but it's been around for a long time. Caught an awful lot of fish. Yep. Yep. It's a great. Do you fish? Uh, before, real quick question. Mm-hmm. If you're choosing between, say, this and the, our last fly, mm-hmm. what's the biggest factor? Is it water? color for you uh, or water water level water level okay. and uh, uh uh time of year but mostly um yeah that's actually a great question so not to dive too deep but this is kind of what we do i guess so. yeah that's okay <laughs> no no that's a great that's a great question it's actually something i something i meant to meant, meant to uh, meant to say when i was getting into it but there's a pretty big difference in weight between this guy and this guy right so there's really no added weight unless you want to put like a wire rib, which I'm going to do on this guy, other than the hook, other than the hook on this, where this guy's got the lead wrapped behind the cone. So um, when this guy hits the water, he makes kind of a splash. If you're in a situation later in the summer, the water is low, you got skinny water, or you're fishing in skinny water in a riffle or something like that, and you don't, you think maybe you might blow a fish if you if you chunk something in there, you might blow them out of there. I want to fish something like this? Yeah. So, so that's the big that's the big uh, that that's the that's the most important thing. The other thing about these uh, unweighted uh, hair streamers like this is that um, you send them somewhere, they go they'll go there. Yeah. I mean, you can throw these guys like a laser. Whereas because of the weight on the other guy. You may have to, you know, you may have to lob him in there. Sure, your loops are not going to yeah. be as tight, probably. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where this guy, he he doesn't weigh any, he doesn't weigh anything. He's going to go. You're going to, you point your finger and he go, he goes right there. Yeah. So he's a guy that you can put right on the wood. Awesome. And yep. Yeah, so that's the classic Mickey Finn. The version that I like is this guy. And that is a Mickey fin tied with dyed squirrel tail. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So what I've done is the original has the bucktail and that adds some flotation to it. It's going to keep him up high. This guy doesn't have a lot of weight. I'm going to add a little weight because I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to add a, uh, a, a silver wire rib to him. But uh, this is a guy that is going to, uh, he's going to fish in the upper, foot to 18 inches of water and uh and uh and you can you can swim him and like i said he's gonna go um he's gonna go wherever you point him and, and you can gonna, work it right over the top of a bunch of wood too you right? can work it right over the top of a log jam or a piece of wood or uh um and then if you uh if you uh if you pull him up you know let's say you throw him in, you throw him into you throw him under a sweeper or something like that and you work him out and nothing happens you can 
drift him back a little bit and he will he will sink back a little bit and stuff he's uh, yeah been a really really good uh really really good little fly for me especially in situations like that so we are going to use the exact same hook that's the ns one the ns 118 classic streamer hook and i don't know if i said it the first time but this is a 4x long streamer hook and then like i said for the last one the uh an equivalent or a replacement hook would be the daiichi 2220 which is their 4x long standard streamer hook so let's see we won't need that guy very few materials for this fly we're going to use the same thread GSP 50 in white. This happens to be Vivas. I use Vivas and Semperfly interchangeably. So whatever I have on hand or whatever I can get. Yeah. They're both good. Both really strong. All right. So we'll put this guy up here again. So we've got a silver tinsel body. Ribbed with either a, a oval tinsel if you don't want the weight. Or I'm going to do the uh, uh, silver wire, add a little bit of extra weight. And then the wing is two colors, three stacks of uh, dyed squirrel tail. You got yellow, red, and yellow. And we finished it off with a little head of, a little head of black thread, just because that's the classic uh, Mickey Finn uh, color of the head. So I add some, uh, so I put my thread on, wrap a base of thread back to the barb. I'm gonna run it back up a couple of eye widths behind the eye. I'm gonna tie in my rib. So this is medium silver ultra wire. And he's brand new. Ooh. Brand spanky. Ooh. Didn't explode, did it? No. <laughs> if it did, it was through user error. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to invest oh, in a, a good. invest in a large pair of uh, cheap nail clippers for my wire stuff. Any heavier wire, at least for this kind of stuff, it's fine. As you can see by the jaws, I have tried to cut heavier stuff. It doesn't work out that good. So for that, I use side cutters. Invest in a good pair of, of uh, Stanley side cutters and leave them on the bench Yep. for doing brushes and stuff. So I'm just going to lay this guy right on top. Just cover him with thread. Oh man, you know what? I just realized I tied a whole fly without my eyes. I, I was kind of impressed. I was... <laughs> I was like, wait, man, I'm, my eyes are getting tired. I was like, no, <laughs> it's not tired. It's it, it, Your eyes are getting old. All right. All right, so a little uh, hack that I like to use, instead of having a whole bunch of spools of tinsel all over the place, when I got to do like whole bodies and stuff, I mean, there's nothing wrong with like tying in like the traditional way would be to tie in like a medium or a large silver tinsel like we used for the rib on the last fly up here at the top. Or you'd hear you tie it in at the front and then you'd wrap it back and then you'd wrap it forward covering any spots that you missed and tie it off in the front. That can be frustrating at times i yes. find that to be frustrating so kind of a hack that i do is i just grab my silver flashaboo and i'll pull out like half a dozen seven eight strands of that that up And 
And I'll tie that right in. Then the trick with this is if you let slack into this, it's going to the uh, if you let slack into this, the uh, the fiber or the yeah the the fl the flash blue fibers are going to separate more. So you want to kind of keep real good tension on it. I like wrapping flash blue though because it's. If you get the really wide tinsel, it binds on itself t yeah, at times. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's so, you know, I mean, there are guys who are really, really good at doing it. You see oh, yeah. the guys, the Atlantic salmon guys and some of the guys on the interwebs and stuff who are like really super good at doing, making nice flat bodies like that. I am yeah. not one of them. I, I don't, uh, I just, uh, uh, like you said, it's, you, know, you always wind up with uh, with an edge up. And uh, it just looks ugly. So we do like a double wrap right there. Now here you can decide if you wanted to have a little extra flash in this fly. You can leave this. And then after you rib your wire, fold this back over and use it as like a flashy underwing mm -hmm. before you put the hair on. We're not going to do that. We're just going to do a, we're just going to do the straight version. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. But if you wanted to add a little bit flat, a little bit more flash to the fly, that's an easy way to do it. And then again, we're going to counter wrap with this guy. Just open wraps. Put, because we counter wrapped, we want to put three or four or five nice wraps on this guy and pull tight because you don't want to impart any slack into that wire, which is easy to do because it's wrapped the opposite way of your thread. And then we'll just helicopter him right off of there. Spin that thread up a bit. Little learning curve with the, with the with the, the thin GSP is that uh, you can get some separation of it and stuff. So just give your bobbin a spin to cord it back up if you need to. Make sure we got that bound down real good. All right, looks good. Now what I like to do for uh, again for durability's sake, come in with a little solar res bone dry. Let's paint some of that on there. Don't need a lot. We just want to put a little epoxy on that flash of Keep teeth from getting in there and tearing it out. The other thing it does is it gives it that gives it that ultra wet look. Really amps up the shine. So we zap it. Then we're ready to move on to our hair. So I've got three small, sti small size stackers, like so. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to prep. I I was working on that one already. I'm going to prep all three stacks of hair so I can just put them on one after another. So we need a yellow squirrel tail, ethically sourced. <laughs> Not the and rust died. way. And dyed. Not the rust way. And dyed. <laughs> ethically sourced and dyed. And red. And I tell you what, oh, I want to say it was probably during the COVID year, the, the full on, but there was a, there was like a year 
where we could not get squirrel dyed squirrel tail. Yep. I couldn't find it anywhere. We're in a weird spot with bucktail right now. It's kind Are of we? a weird, yep. at least from Wapsie, it's a, it's like it doesn't exist. Just Thankfully we have it, huh? some really, really good regional and even semi-local guys dying bucktail. Yeah, really, I, really good I saw. stuff. What's that company that you have on the wall? The Prime? Or? Yeah, the, the PMD, the Prime PMD. Michigan deer. Really good. Yeah, it looks really nice. All right, so I'm going to... So I got my first stack of yellow. And we're going to put three stacks on this. All about the same amount of hair, which doesn't have to be a whole lot. That's about right. We're going to put three stacks on about like that. And I am going to stack these because I want the tips to be all lined up. You don't have to if you don't want to, but I think, uh, for me anyway, I, uh, I like it. So there's my red. I'll take out the short guys. Throw him in stacker number two. And we go back to yellow. And I find tying the tying tying this fly anyway, whereas when I'm tying the like the collar, tying that deer hair collar on the last fly, I always I always, I always wind up having more hair than I think I need, and and it works out. This is for for this particular fly. It always turns out being less hair than I think I need, but mm -hmm. I just go with it because I know it's going to turn out. <laughs> yeah, because uh, because this is even with this GSP thread, we're going to have a single tie-in point for all this stuff. So we we're not going to have uh for the for the for this for these three pack. Well, three it's nice because you can get away with that. I mean, you're not yeah. putting in tons of wraps per stack yep with yep, that thread yep yep exactly but i guess what i'm trying to say is that it is possible to put too much hair on this <laughs> it is possible i have done it i've tried to do it comes out ugly all right so we've got our first stack of hair and i like to squirrel tail because you've got once you got it stacked you've got this nice yellow tips you've got this black bar and that way it gives me a, a, a really nice place to measure so what i like to do is i like to put the the beginning the 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 beginning of that black bar that junction between the yellow tips and the black bar right even with the end of the bend of the hook then that gives me the same result every time and then it steps up a little bit every time every for different hook sizes up or down So this time, I want to get, like you said, as few wraps as possible with as much pressure as possible for each of these stacks. So I'm going to twist my thread counter, spin my thread, my bobbin counterclockwise to cord up my thread. I'm going to do a pinch wrap here, which is I just put pinch, brought the thread up, no tension, and pinched it between my fingers. And I'm going to bring it down. Wait, you know what? I forgot something. I forgot a trick. We something like tricks. Really, really important. Because the squirrel tail is really slippery. And the GSP is very slippery. You're always going to get a little creep on this when you try to tie this stuff in. And the creep is bad. So you combat that. This is an old, like a, this is a, a like a classic wet fly or Atlantic salmon trick. Wax will help with that adding some wax to the thread will help and it's kind of counterintuitive because you think you know one will make it even slipperier but what it's going to do is it's going to help that thread grip so we're going to lay that right there spin that up little pinch 
If you notice, you see where my thread is there? Whoops. Oh, I let, I let it slip because I was trying to demonstrate. So I got a little slip, but not too bad. Let's start to pull it. Put a couple more on it. A couple more. And a couple more. Because I pinched it, I placed the hair right there and pinched it on either side with my thumb and my forefinger to, to, to at least try to keep it from sliding around the sides of the hook. And I actually did a pretty good job that time. See that? Looks good on top of the hook there. Yep, yep. So it's right on top, and I have a minimum of fibers trapped down. Oh, let's do, let's not forget. Wax, tie in, and repeat. Yep, wax, tie in, and repeat. And if you notice, I haven't trimmed the butt sections. I'm going to leave them there to help steer these remaining two clumps right where I want them. So I make sure I get, I'm just prepping this here by making sure I get the short ones out. I'm going to push that wing down. Come in and measure the red to the same length. Spin. Couple of wraps tighten. Couple more tighten. Couple more and tighten. There we go. And you see now, because I'm right-handed and I tie away from me, I did get, I did press, I did push a little bit of my yellow out. So we're just gonna grab it. It's not that big of a deal. What we want is a. Uh, And what I like to do is come in with my thumb and just kind of spread that red out a little bit. One more of those. Shorty's out. Same deal. Press the wing down. Come in, measure it. Couple of wraps. Tighten. Couple more and tighten. Couple more and tighten. Let's see how we did. That looks pretty good. Maybe come in and give him a little flattening. It's got a lot of life, that squirrel. Like, yeah. It's a, it's a pretty nice, it's a resilient material to work with. You yep, know, it's, it's resilient not... and it's and it's also a solid hair. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't have any air trapped inside it. Like the, like the, the bucktail. Like, like the bucktail. Yeah. So you put this fly, um, you tie them both the same. And you put this fly next to this guy. This guy is going to ride a little deeper on average. And, uh, and I find that that, you know, a lot of time, a lot of times it's just, it is just what you need. Just what sure. the doctor ordered, you know, just that little bit of that guy kind of. There we go. We got just a little bit of hair wrapped a little bit. Not too not not too big of a deal. Anything I don't like I can trim out. Now what I can come in, now I'll come in and uh, grab this stuff up. Set my set my scissors at an angle. Oh, 
We'll trim most of that out of there. Come in and nip the I knew I forgot something, but this is a really good place if you have one of those uh, one of those cautering tools. Oh yeah, you can come right in and you can burn this just carefully. <laughs> you can come in and you can you can you can just you can just burn this guy right down to real to to nothing. But because we're working with the GSP, we can. Uh, I'm gonna build up a little bit in front here, so it doesn't slip. And then right there, I'm just going to put a couple of half hitches right there. So this next step is totally optional. Next step is totally optional. I do it just because the, the, the classic Mickey Finn has a black thread head. And I'm going to finish the head with a little black thread. This is just 70 denier uh, ultra thread. because I like it because it lays nice and flat. I don't know. I think there's something classic about that, that black head just finishing things off. It looks yeah. classier. Yeah. You could go any way you want. You could put a crazy, you know, color on there. But yeah. And the thing about the white GSP is that if you were to just hit that with that solar res or head cement or something like that, it's just going to go clear. Yep. Exactly. It, it, it's going to go colorless and, uh, and it's not where there's, you know, there, there's just not going to be a, there's not going to be, there's going to be nothing wrong with it at all. So I'll just finish this guy with a couple of half inches here. Don't need to get crazy with a whip finish or anything because we're going to finish him with the solar res. I love that little fine tip brush. Oh, so nice. It is excellent. So nice. Like I've got, like if I want like a real, if I want like a real, like classy, like a shiny head, sometimes I'll do like a couple of, uh, I'll do like super glue or the epoxy or mm -hmm. something other. And then I'll use those, the Sally's. Yeah. But the brush on the Sally's that comes with the Sally's is oh, so humongous. You that, have to do the extra step of like putting it on a sticky note, then using a bodkin to apply yeah. it. And then, yeah. Well, the first thing I, for, first time I use it, I open it up. I take a, I take a pair of scissors and I trim it down to nothing. Yeah. Trim the brushes right off. Yeah. 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 So that's a good trick. Well, I think that, right, there you know, you go. I've, I've played with a lot of different resins. I think it's like those clear resins are always going to be a little bit easier and friendlier to work with mm -hmm. over a specific thread. Mm -hmm. And that solar res, my favorite thing I learned about that in the past few years is that if it gets clumpy on you, it's just been stored in somewhere cold and you can put it in the microwave. No kidding. About eight seconds. It'll, mm. It's hidden on the back of the instructions, but if, if it's ever, because I get it, it gets shipped in the winter. It sits in a truck. It's cold. It oh. gets a little clumpy, but it's a glass bottle. Yeah. You know, I, uh, uh, you know, I chucked a bottle uh, 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 uh -oh. a, few, a few years ago. I think a few people out. have over yeah. the years. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. just pop it in the microwave for eight seconds or so. And it's good as new. It's oh, man. awesome. That's, that is awesome. That's good to know. It's good. Only at the Northern Angler. YouTube live. <laughs> get to get the good stuff. Yep. There he is. There's your lightweight option. And, uh, and did you have a name for this? I'm sorry. Uh, just a squirrel Mickey Finn. Squirrel Mickey Finn. Squirrel Mickey okay. Finn. I, yeah. yeah. I don't, I didn't, I didn't rename it or anything like that. <laughs> like, a, you know, it's name sometimes it after popular yeah. in the fly tying community. Never. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the popular thing in the fly tying community is to rename. A, so, uh, just a squirrel Mickey Finn. Nice. And, the. One of the reasons that uh, uh, that I like to squirrel for this fly, other than is like I said, it's got it's got more movement than bucktail in the water. Um, it absorbs it's a solid hair, so it absorbs no water. 
and it, and it, and it tends to run a little, it tends to run a little deeper. But I think the modeling on the squirrel really has the yellow and the red really has, uh, it really has this great minnow vibe to it. Yeah. There are two specific kinds of minnows that are common in, in different brook trout habitats. You have, uh, probably the more, probably the more common is the black nose dace, mm-hmm. the black nose dace, which when the males are spawning gets kind of a, uh, gets a yellow back and yellow and, uh, kind of dirty yellow fins and a pretty prominent red stripe right down the middle. So even though there is another classic fly called the black nose dace, if I had to guess what the original Mickey Finn was in, was meant to imitate, it would be the spawning male black nose dace. Sure. Whether they in, intended it that way <laughs> or or that landed way. there. Yeah, or <laughs> landed there. That would be that would be my that would be my, my guess. And there's another one uh, and I always get this wrong. It's not the red side dace. The red side dace is an endangered species. The red bellied dace, which I have, which um, I don't know if you've ever seen any of them. They are typically found in slower sections and boggier sections. Okay. But they are really cool. They are the short, stumpy, fat little dace minnow. And when the males are spawning, they color up and their bellies are bright red. They've yeah. got two black spikes or two black stripes down the side of them and their fins are yellow. Yeah. And uh, I think that that squirrel with all that modeling and then some yellow and red in there and stuff is just such a, that that's, that's what it's, no, that's how it speaks to me. When yeah. I see it, I say, Oh, red belly days. Oh, black nose days, spawning sure. black nose days. I look at this and I almost see, like par marks for immature fish as yep, well, yep. you know, with that vertical yep. contrast, which yep. is really cool. Yep. Could be that too. It just, you know, it looks like something that might be good to eat. Yeah. You know, another reason I, you know, I just think that one of the best books out there is Kevin Feenstra's matching bait fish. Yeah. It's yep. so cool. I mean, I'll page through that thing every other week just to, Oh, look at that. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And it, you know, it kind of opens your eyes to a, a part of this sport that a lot of people don't go down to that rabbit hole. Yeah. It's a yep. cool way to, you know, find some associations and some fly design ideas. Yeah. That's a, that's a terrific, that's a terrific book. That's a, that's a great, that's the book that, uh, that's the book that makes me, uh, makes me angry on the interwebs whenever I, whenever I see, a, <laughs> whenever I see somebody posting a picture of a, of a big colored up common shiner and calling it a creek chub. Sure. I want to say, <laughs> you don't need to read Kevin's book. <laughs> you don't know your fish. I know your stuff. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but it makes me mad. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> we all, things, we all have little, that. Little, Every time I hear, you know, the sound of an eagle in a TV show, that's really a red tail hawk. Yeah. It like, it, my wife is more annoyed with me than yeah. with the incorrect sound effect. I yeah, think the other, because it drives yeah, me nuts. Just the other night I watched a movie where an Eagle came down and grabbed a fish off the water and it was the call of a loon. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 They made wow, a, They had him making a... the call of a loon. A loon was calling <laughs> while the Eagle was grabbing a fish. Talented hawk. Yeah. <laughs> That's so yeah, funny. Fantastic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Well, where's a good place for for people to to find you too online? I know, and I know you're not going to give the Russ response, which is don't. But <laughs> I still think it's um, funny. Uh, I'm online at at the Uper Fly Life. Yeah, and um, you kick. You've done videos on. I know at least our our first fly there. Before, yep, yep I did the the uh, bucktail winged version of that fly. Okay, it's on my YouTube page yeah. at the Uper Fly Life. And uh, I don't have a lot of content there. Uh, I, like we talked earlier. Uh, Less like, is more. Like, yeah, I'd like, you know, uh, I'll go through a string where I'll do two or three of them and then I won't touch it for three, four, five, six months. That's okay. <laughs> it's, it's not going away. Like it's, it's for there for people who want to go yeah. find some good fly options yeah. for this kind of stuff. I yeah. think but it's. But then uh, Instagram and Facebook, the same deal. The yeah. Uper, the Uper Fly Life. Yeah. That's good. We found there. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, put up, uh, I think it's, if it's not already right in our link, I'll put it there as well. It should be in there. I think. Yeah, so, cool. yeah. I have no idea how much time we have. Well, I don't We've know been cranking. Uh, we're at an hour and 50 minutes. Are we and really? It's, it shocks everyone. Everyone's like, <laughs> I don't know if I can fill this much time. And then bam, <laughs> we're at two hours because yeah. it just, we go and we go down the rabbit holes and chit chat and 
we if you want to squeeze one more in, we we can do a quick one. All right, let's do the dry. Then. Let's do it. No, I brought I brought four. I brought, you brought three four, and we're at two hours. <laughs> three streamers in a dry. No need to break Alan's record. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get stuff out here, and this guy actually goes pretty fast. Yeah. So, here's what we got, and I was excited to not see this guy in your bins. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so, it probably just means I haven't put it out yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy, uh, this is a fly that's developed by a, a guide out in Paradise Valley, uh, in the Paradise Valley region of Montana named Walter Weesey. And it is called the GFA Hopper. Yep, so for my for my small stream and my brook trout fishing and stuff, um, I don't do a ton of matching the hatch matching the hatch. Um, because brook trout really for the most part for a lot of for the most part they aren't that particular. If you uh, if you throw something chunky and good in front of them, they're probably gonna eat it. Not always, but I found that most of the time that is the case. Well, I think they like to eat. I think fish, you have to I think people get bogged down with matching the hash sometimes. Yep. A lot of times where, you know, if you, it's fun. It, it is the next step in terms of sometimes enjoyment and problem solving. It's, is enormously satisfying, but you don't always have to, you know, fish have to eat. And you just have to show them something that's enticing yeah, yeah, and buggy and you can still fool some great fish on top water. Yep. You know, I mean, it's, it's yep. a fun way to fish. So yep, don't just, get bogged down in the hatches. I get people, you know, sitting out on the riverbank in February waiting for blue winged olives. I'm like, <laughs> you have way tiny, too much time. Tiny winter stone. That's right. The that's tiny right. winter stone. So, you know, every Every third year on the blue moon, the tiny winter stone <laughs> hatches. It's in. usually the same year as dog man. I find, yeah, you know, yeah, that's hatches, the... in, hatches in numbers. And it's like a, it's like a mouse hatch in New Zealand. Yeah. In February. All right. So this is Walter Weesey's GFA hopper and the GFA stands for general foam attractor. Um, as you can see, he's a, uh, kind of a, a tight little foam guy. Got some, so what we've got is we're going to have some, I got some ice dub on there, two colors of foam. The original, the, the, the standard GFA hopper is just the one, one foam. I'm going to add a second color. Um, I actually got that from, uh, there's a really talented tire out in Utah. His name is Peter Steen on uh, Instagram. His handle is flyfish Pete. It's a really, really excellent small batch commercial tire. Mm. Does some does stuff with uh, fly fish food guys and all that kind of stuff. Ties all kinds of different stuff, and he ties these really cool uh, double double foam uh, uh, GFAs. And I I just love them. I love to fish them, and they're really pretty uh, quick and easy to tie. So I've got two colors of foam. I got some rubber legs. These happen to be the uh, perfectly barred silly legs in hopper yellow which is like my all-time favorite rubber leg got some ice dub olive we're gonna throw on there which you can never go wrong with deer hair wing and uh that's about it uh this is the only fly tonight i'm not going to tie with gsp <laughs> uh the hook i like for these guys is actually the new mustad hook one of the mm. new mustad hooks and I've, I've gone to these for most of my foam flies and stuff. It's the... Don't forget your eyes. Oh, thank you. No, I will need it. I might not even need them for this fly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, this is the Alpha Point Classic Long Dry. It's the R43 AP. Comes like that. And this is not like your grandfather's Mustad hook. They've done a really good job with some of these new hooks they've come out. I really like them for certain stuff. This is one of those things. Um, long bodied dry flies. I also use this a lot. Brown drakes, um, uh, hairy drakes, and that kind of stuff. Long or uh, uh, larger dry flies and stuff. I use them a lot. 
Um, I've caught some awful big fish on them. I have yet to bend one out. So, and they've, they've, you know, they're, like I said, they're not your granddaddy's must add hook. They've got a nice little tiny little barb on them now and kind of a non glare finish and stuff. I really dig them. So I've got some hopper yellow, uh, ultra thread and 70 denier. We're going to wrap some thread on. I'm going to put my eyes on. There we go. And we need some ice dough. I'm going to spin a nice ice dough body on this guy. All right, so I'm going to do, I'm actually doing my favorite color combo of this guy, which is the tan and the yellow. And uh, tan and yellow is my favorite color combo for a lot of stuff. Um, double deceivers, like tan, yellow, and gold is a you know confidence color for me. Tan in general wants, say... The middle to the last week in June hits up there. The spruce moth hatch happens. Oh, yeah. And those guys hang it. Those, those guys will be around. They're going to be around in some way, shape, or form. Really, like, like probably through the end of August. They just don't stop. And they can be really, really heavy. And there are times that, uh, there are times that, I mean, like, so heavy that, you, it, what you're, it, it's like, it's like a snowstorm when you're walking to the creek and it, along the, everything you brush into has these little tan moths coming off it. And when there's spruce moths around, you can throw anything tan on the water and brook, brook trout will eat it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So it, you, you can go with, you know, if you want to do the double one with the yellow on it, great. It makes, you know, it makes a great hopper. Yeah. Kind of, kind of, kind of, a. Uh, doubling your chances and stuff like that. But if you just wanted to go tan, all tan or uh, just all tan foam or something like that, it's really a tan is tan is it in the summertime up there. I have found because of those little moths. So we'll wrap some of that right there. Now for the body on this guy, I'm going to, Use the uh, yeah River Road Creations Chernobyl cutter. This mm -hmm. is the small one. Well, the hook size is ten, and that's a three X long dry fly hook, which is the other reason why I use the Mustad because there are not a lot of other companies that are even making a three X long dry fly hook anymore. So for this cutter, if you've never seen one of these before, it's a razor sharp cutter cut into the shape of a Chernobyl ant body. Comes with a little rubber pad. You're going to put the foam on top of the pad and chunk out your body. There we go. And if you were going to tie a bunch of these, you could just chunk out a whole bunch of bodies. I know you guys like, uh, who's the, the tight lines guy? tight lines guy on youtube yeah. uh tim flagler and yep. stuff he's got he's got like uh if you watch um um he actually has a video for this fly um and he's got uh he's got like a a, a plano box just full of cut foam bodies yep. using the cutter so that would be a good way to go if you're really into like foam foam bugs but i think if just uh be careful i've done because i've cut a ton of foam all at once with this set and ergonomically, it's not the friendliest thing on your the palm of your hand. Yeah. If yeah, you yeah. cut a dozen of those, it's gonna you're gonna have a little indent right in the middle of your palm. You you yeah. almost need to create a handle for it or something. I I don't think they're interested in. That yeah, that yeah really, you can't get but, the, you can't get the Chernobyl the Chernobyl tunnel syndrome. No. Right. So we're all done with that. All right, so I've got my two pieces of foam. 
And now I'm going to need some super glue. So I'm going to take a little super glue, a little brushable super glue. This is just crazy glue. I'll brush that right over the top of that dub body. I'm going to take my tan body and I don't need this to stick out. I need some extra out in the front. If you look at the original, we're going to fold that guy back over. So we need extra there. We don't need a, a real long tail sticking out. We just want enough stick, a little bit sticking out past the bend of the hook to help float it back there because there's a lot of weight there. So I'm going to lay that right there. And I'm, what I'm going to do when I'm attaching the foam so I don't cut the foam is I'm after every wrap, I'm going to tighten a little bit. I'm going to tighten a bit. And then every wrap after that, I'm going to tighten a little more and tighten a little more, tighten a little more. And eventually you'll get to where there's no more give in it. And then you're good. Oh, my glue grabbed a little bit there. Oh, it'll be fine. Actually, it's perfect. All right, so now I'm going to come in with my yeller, line up the, the tail together, and do the same thing. Pretty tight, a little tighter, a little tighter, and I broke my thread. Oh, well. It happens to all of us. Yep. Yep. I am using, you know, arguably... Oh, thread that might be on a little light side for this, but I don't like building up too much. So well, I always say go as light as you can get away with, with yep. your thread. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. A couple extras, make sure it gets bound in real nice there. Now, actually, you know what? We'll just go ahead and do the body and then I'll trim later. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press these guys down. I'm going to walk my thread back in a nice big segment and I'm going to do the same thing that I did over both. So I'm going to go once, pull a little bit, tighten a little more, tighten a little more, tighten a little more. I'm going to do four wraps each segment. And my goal is to get three nice big segments and then a tail. Tighten. You can hear the thread yeah. tension. Yeah, you get that ASMR. Yeah. It's like, a little tighter and then a little <laughs> tighter and then a little tighter yet yeah so we want one more and that's great it gives you a really good idea exactly how tight I'm pulling on that right at the limit yep there we go there's our three body sections four count in the tail and then all I'm going to do is I'm going to just cross back over the top. And then we're not going to need, we need this tan, but we don't need this yellow. So we're going to come in, I'm going to put my scissors in there and I'm going to give it a tug so I can trim it as close as possible. There we go. All right. So we're going to put our deer hair wing in now. I've got just a piece of, uh, again, this is nature spirit. Such good stuff. I just love their stuff. Love their hair products. Nip out a nice, fairly small bundle of hair get rid of the under fur etc I'm gonna go ahead and stack it you don't have to if you don't want to this fly I'm kind of all about durability So I'm going to glue a bunch. I'm going to put a bunch, put a drop of super glue right there. That's where I'm going to tie the hair in. I'm 
I come in and I'm going to measure about the same length as my tail. This guy I'm going to pre-trim the front so I can set him right on top there. A couple of wraps around and then pull tight. And then you can wrap right through those butts to help secure them there. And we got a nice little wing right on top. Now we're ready to fold. I'll fold this guy back. Same technique every time I'm tying down foam. Tight, tighter, tightest. Till it stops moving. There we've got it. Now we've got a nice fat hopper head. Duo colored. And I've got a couple of legs here. What I'm gonna what I like to do just for like speed of tying and stuff is I'll pull these legs off of the off of the uh, the the piece that they come in cut them in half cut them in half again and then they're pretty much perfect for what I want and I'm just going to tie them in basically at the halfway point So what I did was I tied them in together on top with a couple of wraps. I'm just going to take the one on the far side, pull him to that, pull him to that side, take the one near me, pull him to that side. Usually I line them up on that inner color. Looks like I got a little deer hair that slipped on me around the side there, but we'll cover it up with the leg. Then we'll just put some extra wraps on there. few securing wraps. Make sure we got them in there good. Then, again, durability. Since there's a lot of stuff going on at this tie-in point, I'm going to paint a little super glue on my thread. Three or four wraps there. And then just for ease of finishing, I'm just going to bring my thread up. Wrap it around the hook guy. You could whip finish around in between them legs if you wanted to. I just don't like messing. After I get that glue in there, I don't like messing around the lip. Right, because your thread can much. catch. And... Yeah. That's called a... Awesome. That's called a pro release. Thread breaks. Right? That's right. That's right. All right. Last thing to do is I just want to trim this little guy here down a bit. That is Walter Weesey's GFA Hopper. That was simple. I like that. Yeah. And I really like the the leg technique. I think that's a great way to not add too many wraps and everything. You have a lot more control. You can mm -hmm. take your time. You can reset, mm -hmm. you know, before you really yeah, yeah. crank them down. Just put them on with two or three wraps without tightening them down. They'll stay right there. Yep. You can put them on, you know, especially you've got a really nice place to attach them right there. Really nice wide place. You can put them in there and then you can put them right where you want. And then once you get them there, you just tighten, add some tight wraps. Any other random colors people should try with this fly? Ooh, anything you want. Okay. Um, uh, I'm a, this is, like I said, this is my favorite one. This is my favorite one. Um, uh, of course, all the staples, black for crickets. Yep. Um, or uh, maybe cicadas this year. Black and orange for cicadas. <laughs> Maybe some maybe monster about ones. This big. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Maybe about that big and black and orange. Yeah. Nice big old long black and orange legs sticking off of them. That would be fantastic. So I might have to do that when I get I home. I might have to try that too. <laughs> I actually. Have to do that, when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> that looks great. Um let's see. Um, um olive and yellow. 
all your set, all, all your, your, uh, 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 your, your standard and, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I hopper mean, heck, colors. We, we crush fish on kind of the, there was the, the light pink thing was popular for a while, yeah, yeah. but it's tough to go wrong with purple. A purple yeah. chubby is yeah. tough to beat in my, yeah. in my world for brook trout, but I mean, it's, or the Royal, like you throw yeah. on that little Royal stripe yeah. is really good some years, but we, I've seen, you know, it helps to have a few different things, different times of the years, yeah. you know, and the works, thing with, so. and the thing with this fly is that you can do all those chant. You can do all that specialty stuff with just the dubbing, right? You can do peacock, red peacock and whatever color foam you want. Yep. Like usually with a Royal one, I'll do black. Yeah. I'll do black. I'll do black on top. Yeah. And stuff. Or you can do, yeah, I mean, just like, you know, go crazy. <laughs> yeah. And you can do a bunch of, you can do, you know, six dubbed bodies all at once, mm-hmm. cut the foam, then do all the foam together and, mm-hmm. you know, production tie it a little bit. And instead of, you know, each step yep. and getting frustrated yep. with dubbing, cut all the legs at the same, cut all the legs at the same, yeah. cut a bunch of legs at the same time. Yep. Exactly. You know, you know, buy like, you know, buy four. Buy four dozen of these little stackers like me. Yeah. <laughs> Shops will love you. I promise you that. Shops will love you if you buy a ton of stackers yeah. and just, you know, line all your hair up all, all at your once. Hair. Yeah. Why all not? your hair. I mean, it it can get a little frustrating. I mean, I noticed you use that little prep station there. That's I'm sure that's a, a big help, the little foam prep station. Yep. Um, yep. You're yep. certainly not the first tire I've seen use that, and it's a great way you know, without buying all the stackers, you can line all those products up. Yeah. Yeah. You just line everything right in there. That's all pre-slit and for transport and stuff. It yeah. Pops, pops right apart. Part. Wham, bam. Yeah. Good to go. It's a good way to go. Well, all right. Any questions that anybody have anything? Everybody's just, uh, been shouting out the love. Uh, Jay says, this has been fa- fantastic. Um, ton of guys are excited to get out there and, chase some brook trout it looks like so i'm glad you know big big thanks todd for coming down and doing this um really really appreciate that no Um, problem no problem thank you for thank you for having me i I can't um i mean these these things that you guys started putting on i know you started them in covid and stuff Mm -hmm. like that but they're it's so cool like when i'm tying at home to be able and i'll do i do it all that i do it all the time i Sometimes I like to have something going on in the background, not all yeah. the time, but when I do, it's almost always one of you guys' YouTube, one of you yeah. guys' YouTube things. I'll put on Johnny Ray sure. from two years ago, or I'll watch, um, or I'll watch Russ, or I'll watch, or I'll watch Corey tie wet flies. Sure. Or There's uh, so many little nuggets and I, yeah, I like to go yeah. back and see these. Oh, I do. You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm like keyboard cat back here, yeah. you know, while it's going on. It, it's kind of, it is true. I'm pushing yeah. all these buttons and I don't always catch everything. So it's helpful for me to go back and, and listen and watch this stuff. And, oh, I missed this. He said this about, you know, measuring the squirrel tail or something like mm-hmm. that. You know, it's, there's so many helpful things and we're spoiled here with really good guests. You know, with, I mean, I just feel lucky. We have all these great tires willing to show up at the shop, hang out for a few hours and, chit chat and tie flies and goof off i yeah, mean it's yeah. that's it's a, why it's, it's such a, a cool community is a, people it, are very willing to share their yeah, knowledge yeah it's a good it's a good time so it's a good it's, time it's so good I enjoy, so. enjoy myself immensely well i'm glad we <laughs> I, I think this was the perfect one to to finish the season trout with. seasons is in a couple trout weeks. seasons just a few weeks away yeah. you've got time enough to fill your boxes and get stuff ready yeah. um so Come. Hundreds and hundreds of miles of water is going to be opening up. Everybody's excited. There's a lot of good vibes this year. I mean, people are coming in excited to get back on the water. So yeah. we're happy to see that happen. Always happy to help with that. Um, guys, remember, you can all rewatch these. You can find Todd online, seek him out. Uh, the Uperfly or the Uperfly Life. Uperfly Life. Yep. Okay, I got it. There's a lot going on. No. <laughs> Once you find one, you'll find the rest. Um, and yeah. we've got guys that are going to try some of these flies and report back in cool. their water. So I'll make cool. sure yeah. we're able to show tag, you. and tag, tag us in photos. Yeah, we, we always to like photos. to show that yeah. kind of stuff off. It's always fun. So um, that's all I got. 
cool. Yeah, Thank season, you. Season, I don't even know whatever this is. I, I don't know, three, four, four, five. Is this, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's plenty. It's enough. So uh, thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. Really for having appreciate me. sharing some awesome yeah. patterns and some great stories to go along with them. Yeah. So. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, like I said, we've already done the film tour, but check out the Cheese Cup coming up. You won't want to miss it. It's a great warm water tournament and a really good cause. Raises money for suicide prevention in northern Michigan. That's it. This is the end of the season. Stop in the shop. We'll get you set up for trout. And uh, that's all we got. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate it. That's it. That's a wrap. 2020, That's a 2024 live time. I know.